Start your company by defining how you want to end it. That is just one of the learnings I got from my talk with Andy Kohlmans. Andy sold his company to his management team, then he wrote the book Sell Your Baby, and he founded, together with his partner in crime, Blackbird Business Events. Within its first year, he became a personality brand running a profitable business. If you want to find out how to sell your baby when you are a personality brand, then this is the episode you want to listen to. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Own Your Story podcast, the place to learn about personality branding, thought leadership, and how to capitalize your reputation. In other words, how to own your story. I'm your host, Bianca Fleerakas, former actress, turned into six-figure entrepreneur, author, and keynote speaker. Let's get started. Tell me what is Blackbird Business? Well, um, Blackbird Business Events is a company me and a few of my colleagues founded. I'm not the only shareholder or owner in that company. And it's, it's, it basically started as an, an, an outlet for a niche I found where I thought, well, there's no courses, there's no education for, for SMB company owners. Um, when it comes to how to become an investor entrepreneur, like what is that sorry in, in, what in is essence, an investor entrepreneur what is that well it's it's an it's a, a business owner who mm -hmm. doesn't just want to be a business operator for the rest of his life like if i look at what is the difficulty and what are the biggest problems for uh first of all the business owners with a with a small or medium business sized company it's, it's often that they lose their passion along the way. They become operators. They start managing problems instead of doing what they like. Mm -hmm. And most of them don't get out of that situation until they retire. Um, they don't see themselves do anything else. They are afraid of, of selling the business at a certain point because they wouldn't know what the heck to do when that business is gone, because they've been focused 100% on that business. And, and it's, it's kind of a little bit what, what I also lived with my first company, because Blackbird Business Events isn't my first business. Um, I started out as an 18-year-old um, young entrepreneur with a marketing company. In the beginning, it was just building websites in an attic somewhere. Um, and it, it grew out to be a, a, a large, um, I can say quite large strategic marketing consultancy firm, where at the end, I was only in that business for one day in a week. I wow. had a management team, I had a CEO who was managing the business, growing the business, which allowed me to start doing different things. And talking with a lot of entrepreneurs, I found that they... They also didn't know anything about what brought me there along the way, like how, how to do share deals with your business, how to find investors to scale it, how to um, do funding rounds, how to make mm -hmm. a business self-operating and all of that, which is a bit more advanced. But And even when an, an entrepreneur would think like, well, that's not for me yet because I only have an, an SMB with five employees, you can only start navigating in the right direction if you know where you're going. Yeah. And to know where you're going, you need to have that information stored in your brain. So okay. it, when it becomes relevant, you at least know which direction to turn. Yeah. So, 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 so that's, that's essentially what, Stephen, what we do. Yeah. So that is what Stephen Covey is saying. Um, start with the end in mind. And that's, uh, you, you find that... Uh, um, our entrepreneurs, Belgian entrepreneurs, lack that information um, because you had to oh, find yeah. out yourself as well as, at the very. I had age. to find out, and uh, even when, when, like, when my company was growing, um, there's a certain point, and and not to go very technical on that, but like when your company reaches an EBITDA 750k. Um, size, that's the moment where a lot of, of, of bigger companies start reaching out to see if they can acquire your company. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what an EBITDA was at that point. 
So it, it was just like, uh, I, I never felt so stupid in, in my entire career. Mm. I was building this beautiful business with the right people alongside me. And I didn't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. And in that process of preparing that business to get sold in, in, in learning about that, um, I also made my mistakes as well. That's also an important aspect. <laughs> um, so, so once you, you start diving and deep diving into that content, looking back now, I can truly say like, if I would have known 50% uh, about these things, what I know today, I would have built my business differently, faster, more, um, more productive and mm -hmm. and i would have gotten a lot further even as an entrepreneur not not that i'm displeased with where i am today but i just found that gap like that information is nowhere to be found yeah i started but, looking at books mm -hmm. yeah, why, why is it why don't, that that, why don't we have that why don't we have that information I don't know. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's, um, I started looking and like, let's say for M and A purposes, the only books I found were from M and A experts, uh, from the United States, but mm -hmm. buying a selling a company in the U S is an entirely different process than Indeed. here in Belgium in Flanders. Yes. So you need that localized information as yes. well. And to be honest, the idea didn't reach my mind until COVID hit. Um, <laughs> COVID learned us a lot of things. I sold my business. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I sold my business just when COVID hit. Uh -huh. um, and, and at that point, I was so fed up with the lack of information out there. I just decided, like, if the book doesn't exist, why don't I write it myself? Yeah. And I, I went actually to the same publisher as where you're writing your yeah. book today. Lano Campus, so, yeah. yes, and they instantly uh, fell in love with the idea. Um, and then afterwards, my publisher, Niels, I think you're mm -hmm. talking maybe to the same person. He um, said to me, well, Andy, um, you need to do a roadshow with that new book. And I was like, okay, but... One thing that I've done very clearly as an entrepreneur is I've reached a point where I only want to be involved in things that I love to do. I I've did my time. I did my years spending time in things that are not related to my field of passion, what I want to do, what I like to do, being that business operator. So for me, one of the things that I don't like about creating events is all the technical stuff. I even get stressed out when I need like this Riverside yeah. thingy to get our <laughs> conversation going. So it's like finding locations, the technical sides, yeah. getting people in a course that that's not my no, passion. No. Let me create content. Let me deliver it. Let me build that expertise yeah. and share it with people. Yeah, yeah. So, but you have a great team. You have was... you have a great partner. Yeah, so yeah. it's 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 your your wife. Yeah. It's it's your partner in life and in yeah, work. My wife is yeah, and she likes and to then do there that is, Yes, she, she, well, she is actually the CEO of the company. She's the better fit for the CEO. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, she, she takes care of the finances and, and all of the major decision making in building the company as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, then there is uh, Bart, who is also a, an, an, a shareholder, but also operates the business. And he actually um, is somebody that I started um, working with, we've we've been in a business venture together when we mm -hmm. were just within our twentieth something years, uh, which was in the media sector where mm -hmm. we. Um, I had a, a website where I sold public uh, publicity ads and stuff, and he had a, a publishing company which did books in the same industry. So we worked together, and I always knew that Bart is somebody who. He's, he's a sound engineer from background. He did big dance events when he was a young guy. He's been putting together events in that space all of those years. So I was thinking like, maybe if I don't want to look at that side for a book tour, I need to get in touch with Bart. Mm -hmm. And then he can help me out with, with 
the things that I don't like to do. Mm-hmm. I called him. We hadn't spoken in a few years. Um, I called him. We were talking for 15 minutes. And all of a sudden he said, well, Andy, um, that's, that's a great idea. But I don't like the idea of just a book tour because with the story that you want to tell, there's a lot more in that. You could mm-hmm. build an entire like educational business from this. Um, and that essentially was the start of Blackbird. Wow. We decided not to do a book tour, but to um, yeah. have these smaller events to yeah. let people know that we're out there. And then we have these five day master classes, courses where people step in on Monday and they only leave at Friday. <laughs> and we start working that entire week to get them up to speed. Yeah. So it, it, it all of a sudden came together. Yeah. And, and y- <laughs> you were really. I can't say lucky because it's more than that. You really found a niche that was, nobody was dealing with it, but it was a hungry no. niche. Can you share us yeah. your, your revenue of, uh, uh, of the year, of this first year? Can you, will you share that with us? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, within Blackbird, uh, we are a very ambitious company. We also want to... Um, we also decided we want this company to grow even bigger than the last one that we founded. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to be very open and honest. We started at the end of last year, which was a very difficult time, a lot of slowing down uh, economy, um, very difficult to get people because we're, 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 of course, in the high value ticket market. So which means somebody who wants to take a course with us, they pay around 9,000 euros for a five day training program. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is high quality, of course, because otherwise it wouldn't keep existing. But um, we are now at the margin of uh, around 1.7 million euros in sales mm-hmm. in the first nine months that we've been active. So yeah, it's that, taken that a is- flight. That is so fantastic. Did you imagine that when you started? No, 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 because like maybe to go back to the beginning of, of, of me reaching out as a public speaker, it started actually, I have to go back to 2016 or something. And Mm -hmm. like, I was well connected as an entrepreneur. I visited a lot of networking events. I knew a lot of people. I was in the marketing business, digital marketing and strategy mm-hmm. and stuff. So it, it always is something that people are interested by. Mm-hmm. And a lot of local um, organizations ask me like, Andy, can you come and tell us something about that? Can you tell your story? And a long time, I think two or three years, I said no, <laughs> because I didn't have the time. Yeah. I didn't have the time until I think it was 2016. We've won an award, um, an an EMEA sized award from Google with our, with our small time company even still. So I was, I was happy with that. And then six months later, I got a call from Google in Brussels and they were like, yeah, we're doing a digital course program we want that content created we want to roll that out and within the next year we want to uh, make 10,000 Belgian entrepreneurs digital savvy Mm -hmm. can you help us with that and my wife was sitting next to me she heard that phone call going on even if it wasn't on speaker she heard that phone call and I was sitting there like yes I want to do this and she was next to me like you don't have any time for that. <laughs> and, and literally, like that was the moment where for the first time I said, yes, I'm going to do this because I knew this is an yeah. opportunity I'll yeah. never get again. Um, yeah. And essentially, it was very uncomfortable. It was saying yes and then looking in the other way and then deciding, okay, how am I now going to make sure that the time that I needed out there I can actually leave this company without everything Mm -hmm. being torn apart. Yes. Which actually was a, was a major step in two uh, different for two different reasons. First of all, it made sure that there was a timetable where I needed to be um, out of my business for a certain amount of time by a certain date. 
mm-hmm. which helped installing management structures in my business very much. And then on the other side, I actually had the chance to discover a new passion, which presented a problem in itself. And that was like, after a few times, I was like, I get fired up even much more from this <laughs> than just sitting behind my desk. Yeah, it's, so it's why addictive. am I not doing this? That's yeah, why we is. call public speaking or everything that's happening on stage as a performer. It's it's like a virus. It's a microbe. Once it's in your body, oh, yeah. you, you n- it never gets out again. You, you come alive when you're on nah. stage. I am. I'm, I'm so alive when I'm on stage. That's that's where I'm supposed to be on stage. And so are you, apparently. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the problem, the problem, it's, it's a on, calling. Yeah, it's a calling. The only problem is that it's a calling that is not scalable. That's a problem. No, it is. It is. Unless you, you turn to technology and AI, but, but I think that is another no, conversation. Even, even in real life, even in real life, like I had the background of being a consultant for many years. Mm-hmm. Like I had a management team in my own business and then I went out of my business to do one-on-one consulting with Mm -hmm. other company owners on how to operate their business better and make it run smoother. That's non-scalable because it's me working with one client and I can only spend that day one on one client every time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the scalable aspect, which drove me to, to go to a training model, is where you can essentially spend one week with not just one entrepreneur, yeah. but with a group of maybe like what we're doing now, 70 mm-hmm. to 80 entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's a scalable model. It's scalable. The only problem is it's also a model where you cannot fall into the trap that everything starts evolving or around the speaker. Mm-hmm. And that's a big problem in a lot of companies, mm-hmm. yeah, not yeah. just companies that are in the training business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I fully agree. It's one too many when you're giving trainings. So that's uh, that's uh, yeah. If, uh, yeah, that's, of course, the the revenue model that works best that and the very high yeah. ticket if you're working one on one. But what I meant was um, when you're invited as a public a keynote speaker on third party events, then okay, you're talking to one too many, and you can, you can hope or 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 research that the audience is a potential client of yours. Otherwise, I shouldn't get up on the stand that stage anyway. But you have to be careful with your time given as given as a keynote speaker when you start speaking oh, everywhere. Yeah. And you're you're a paid it's, speaker. It's it's. One yeah. of the most underestimated yeah, because yeah, I've lot. been dealing with that for many years where I was still uh, in my marketing business. Mm-hmm. One of the things, and that's maybe something nice for the listeners to know as well. One of the first things I did was deconnect myself as a brand, as a speaker mm-hmm. from my company. Okay. Like my topic at that point was still marketing strategy, how to, how to position a company, a business in front of the right audience. That that was my expertise at that time. Mm-hmm. So that was my topic as well, where I was training entrepreneurs about. But the problem that I found with so many businesses, and, and it, it's also, a, I think, a little bit of a disease in the industry as well, to be honest, is that there's a business owner who wants to be on stage. They get the high from it. They love it. And they're using that as a as as an opportunity to sell their business, mm-hmm. which means a lot of companies that 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 create these kind of congresses and events, they are on the lookout to have seventy percent of their speaker bill filled out with people that want to do it for free, mm-hmm. and there is enough people that want to do it for free because of the fact that. They know that if they get put in front of a stage and they start in front of an audience and they start pitching, then they're Mm going to get clients out Mm -hmm. of it. So Mm -hmm. even when they're doing that keynote for free, Mm -hmm. they're still going to be paid within Mm -hmm. the business. The only problem is that as a speaker, you you completely flush down all of your um, credibility Mm -hmm. because now you're just a, a, a puppet with strings 
to create new turnover for your business, mm -hmm. which means that you're making that business dependent on you mm -hmm. as a salesperson. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's wrong. Yeah. Like the first thing that I did was when I went on stage, I also said to people like, well, this is me. I'm Andy. I'm an expert in this. And I'm also an entrepreneur, but I'm not here to speak to you from my business. I'm not even going to tell you what the name of my business is. Funny fact, when my wife was sitting in the back, all of the back rows that she could see, all of those people were looking on my LinkedIn to see which was the name of my company. Mm -hmm. So even if I wasn't telling them, Mm -hmm. They were still looking to see mm -hmm. what my company was. A curious but mind. It is allowed what me. Yeah. yeah. But it allowed me to like instantly put myself in front as an expert, yeah. not there to sell a commercial yeah. agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Fully agree. Although it's it's not uh, um, possible for everybody to to really position themselves straight away no. like that. So. Um, one of the reasons I invited you to become my guest is um, is a question or a dilemma I've been challenged with all of my life, all of my career. Because mm -hmm. as you know, I, my past is in, in the media as an actor. Um, I've been yeah. a, a celebrity in Belgium for a couple of years. And um, so you could say it's all about the personal brand. It's all about the name. And... Um, I've been told, not once, but a thousand times, that when you're a personal brand, your business is not sellable. So you already explained a bit about what you, you should do. But I could not believe that because if you're a personal brand, you, you do have something to sell. But it depends on how you structure your company, as you told yeah. me. Yeah, so it, it does. You do start with selling... Um, um, your competences and uh, your expertise and it's not all, always yeah. easy to find replacement or other team members that are able to deliver the same value as you can and it's the same problem yeah. that you probably had when you try to separate well, yourself from uh, the company I'm, it it could be different for um like people that are operating in the in the training industry like uh, for now i'm just going to talk about everybody who is not in the training <laughs> industry like if you have a marketing company or you're selling ventilation units for houses or or whatever yeah, you're, that's, you're that's doing easy then you should company. only learn the manual and learn some techniques that's the easy part <laughs> no, no answer, the, answer let's, the difficult let's have question. it complex but <laughs> yes the, the thing is, um, I think the major learning for me that I want to share on that part is make sure that you don't become the hamster in the wheel, uh, which means that if you take the hamster out of that wheel, the wheel stops spinning, mm -hmm. which means you need to analyze what your position is as a speaker, as a public figure um, in relation to that business. And in a lot of companies, what I see is that a little bit what I said earlier is that that entrepreneur is the best salesperson in his own business. I actually ask that question a lot in trainings, like who is the best salesperson in, your, in, in their own company? And then all of those hands go up and they're so proud that they are the best sales hunter in their own company. And then I say, that's too bad <laughs> because... You are a liability for your company at this point. The problem is, is just simple. You can be out there as an inspirator, as, an, as a thought leader on your mm -hmm. industry. You just need to make sure to install a system, which means that turnover doesn't get directly linked to you, which okay. means you need to take yourself out of that sales process. And for me, it also has been a mechanism to... to not get stuck in, 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 in difficult discussions as a speaker. I always distant myself from, from the sales aspect, um, which means that I can be out there. I don't need to limit what I say to the way my company does things. I can be that thought leader. Mm -hmm. I can even direct people like, yeah, I have a business. I'm not 
um, doing the sales of that business. But if you want, I can get you in touch with one of my colleagues from the sales team and they'll take it from there, mm -hmm. which means you don't fall into that trap of you selling your time or even worse, they've seen you on stage and it has to do with image as well. They've seen you on stage. And that's the magic about public speaking, of course, because you get to feel important and you're mm -hmm. out there and people start um, throwing underwear in your direction. And no, people start asking autographs and no, <laughs> but you, there is a certain attraction yes. when people see you on a stage yes. that they want to be in your vicinity. Yes. Now imagine being one of those persons and then all of a sudden you meet that speaker five minutes after the keynote and you're like, yeah, I want to maybe buy from your company. And then you're like, oh yes, let me take out my schedule. And next week on Monday, I'll come to your company and I'll visit you and we'll have a sales discussion. Like you instantly take yourself from up there to all the way down mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the image is gone. Yeah. So you, when you put out a standard for yourself, I think you need to be very careful about not to step outside of those boundaries. And yeah. you need to have a very clear vision of what yeah. fits that position and what doesn't fit that position. Yeah. Like I, I, I really relate. Said, yeah, I really relate to what you're saying because I, I, I really, I think the same way too. But on the other side, on the other hand, um, I just had a... Um, a conversation this morning with one of my clients and one of my dearest friends who also says um, we have to be um, the likability and the approachability of you of us um, we should consider that as well uh, if you're not um, approachable enough so then then uh, people you int intimate uh, intimidate people too often and she thought that no. was the case with you can me. be approachable you can be approachable without taking on that role as a salesperson. Yeah, yeah um, you shouldn't be available of most... all of the time as well, in my opinion. Nah, but... nah. But if they have a question about something and they ask you a question, take mm. two minutes to answer that question. Um, mm. If they, if they, if they want to to talk to you outside of the the stage, outside of that keynote. Be open to it. Mm -hmm. uh, stay and, and walk around after a keynote for, for an hour and learn to meet yeah. people and so yeah. on. You can be very approachable as a public figure, but still set that line where you say, okay, but now you're inquiring about sales and this is where I draw the line. I'm not going to be the salesperson for you. Mm -hmm. Give me your card. I'll make sure the right person within mm -hmm. the company contacts you. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. And I think that's a majorly important part because if I were looking to buy your business, the first question I'm going to ask is how much of the turnover comes through you? And if that's a lot, that's a big risk for me taking over that business and paying you for that. And then uh, the second question becomes, well, how much of that turnover would still be here if you are gone tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And then you have an unsellable company. So if you make sure that you become an asset for that company as being a thought leader, as being an ins a source of inspiration for an industry, that's perfectly fine. But make sure that even if you go, people will know this is your business or it has been your business. And you can even still sell that as an asset to the one taking over your business. There's yeah. good examples about that mm -hmm. where um, as a, a, like everybody still knows that Elon Musk once owned PayPal. They still remember it, even if he doesn't have anything to do with it, it still reflects mm -hmm. an image on that company today. Yeah. Um, a local example of that is, uh, maybe you know them, uh, Dries and Yuri from Wasbar. Yes, yes. <laughs> which is like a, a, a nice concept. They sold that yeah. business years ago, even though they were still the face of that business. Yeah, the, still but the boys of Wasbar. Play huh? your, they still are. They still. Um, I, I heard, I think they sold their last percentages a little while back or something like mm -hmm. that. But 
the business was operating, clients were visiting, they were not selling the products in that business. Mm -hmm. They were just a face related to the business, which mm -hmm. means they had a business generating a certain turnover. That business is not going to flunk. It's not going to go down when they sell that business because it's mm -hmm. still the same location, sale, same product, same people operating that business. But then all of a sudden, you're not a liability to that company. You become an extra asset and you yeah. can sell the business and add it to that. Yeah. Sell your rights as like, if you want to use my face for five years more, then, and you want me to do this much um, promotion for that, then we make a separate contract and yeah. you pay me for that. Yeah. So I, I probably think that was the case with um, brands like Bobby Brown. Do you know Bobby Brown, the makeup artist? Yeah. And uh, yeah. The, the woman um, sold her brand, which got her name, uh, and um, wasn't able to, to launch another brand within yeah. the X, Y, Z years. Dries van Nota, the same. So yeah. he has a brand with yeah. his name. And now we, here in Belgium, we have Torfs, we have Willy Nassens. So it's very interesting to find out, and I hope you, you can answer the question. Um, is that a good idea, to build a brand upon your name, with your name, and then are you able to sell it? And T Yeah, what happens next? I, I usually advise against putting your full name in a business, but because it's, it's, it's a usual tactic when you sell a company, You have a, um, I don't know the exact English term for it. Uh, I have to think a little while, but you get that um, you're not allowed to do another business within the next five years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I have to put that out for one second. Okay. <laughs> the, um, you need to, when you, when you do that, um, you're not allowed to step into that industry for the next mostly three to five years. And mm -hmm. that's actually normal from a buyer perspective because mm -hmm. I've paid you a five to maybe seven time EBITDA value on your company. Like all of the profits that are still going to come in in the next five mm -hmm. to seven years are going to be used to pay you the amount of money that you receive today. So, of course, I'm not going to allow you to take your name yeah. with you and start yeah. competing with the business that I just bought, which is something that you have to look into. Um, with Dries van Nolte, I don't know the story exactly, but I can take it that that could be a problem. On the other hand, if you look at most of the multi-generation family-owned businesses like Torfs, that becomes an entirely different story. But even there, um, Wouter, is, is, uh, the, the, he was the CEO for 35 years and he mm -hmm. just recently stepped down. And I actually had a, a conversation with him about it on one of our um, business classes that we do, uh, where he talks about that topic as well. And he, we, had, we were talking about the aspect where you look at a company like Torfs and everybody says, well, yeah, that's the company owned by Wouter Torfs. Mm -hmm. But in reality, there are maybe, shoot me if I'm wrong, 15 shareholders all within that same company. And I think Walter said, like, well, I think I own five or six percent or something like that of that entire business. But you become the face. Yeah. And if you become the face of a family owned business, which carries the family name, that's a whole different story. It's not a problem as such. But you need a transitional period, and I would say maybe five to seven years to step onto the background little bit by little bit, where you make very clearly who's going to take the torch from your hand and, and mm -hmm. get that new era going for the business and, and, and let them move to the foreground of telling their story and yeah. what they want to highlight within that company. Yeah. It's a transitional period, which is a marketing story. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to the beginning of our conversation, um, where the, um, the company owners or the CEOs of companies are not a personal brand, are not known, and are hardly visible online. So we don't see yeah. them. In my book, 
uh, I'm addressing that topic because I think that's a problem. I think nowadays we as a customer or we as an employee want to find out who is in charge, what the vision of that person is, how he is like, because yeah. the CEO and the owner represents the brand and not only the brand, but you want to find out what kind of personality this person is. So, especially in bigger companies and corporates, um, they are they suck in writing and telling stories. Yeah, um, because everything is very dry. Everything is very like number related. It's it's facts. It's mm -hmm. it's our business was founded in. Uh, to, uh, in 1929 yeah, and since then we have 15,000 employees and mm -hmm. I don't care I'm I'm one of your clients I want to know what you can do for me mm -hmm. and what you believe in yeah and that will always be a, some person's story to tell it needs to have a face mm -hmm. and and what CEOs definitely need to understand is that they play a very important role in telling the story of the company they represent on one side on the other side uh, one thing that every ceo will understand is the value of building equity mm -hmm. because most ceos they are either investors in a company or they have a shareholder a, a share a plan where they can like mm -hmm. stock options i think it's called in english where they had get stock options after certain performances or certain years but it's the same with building that personal brand. Mm -hmm. Like it's building equity for you as a person. Yes. If it, it's building a face and yeah. even though it, it can protect you in your current job as a CEO within this company, but it will also present a tremendous value if tomorrow that company kicks you out. Yeah. And you haven't and read my book yet. I'm saying exactly no. the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> that they should uh, yeah. be aware of building legacy for themselves, for the company, and uh, to be aware that they will not be CEO forever. Um, but also, and that it, is something... It's the only thing that nobody will be able to take away from yeah, you. Yeah, it is. It's, it's your story. You own it. Yes. You can't sell it. It's, no, no. It's your personality. No. But, but I've seen a lot of those cases, even locally. I'm not just talking about the, the high-value CEOs of, of mm -hmm. big corporations, but like even with, with smaller business owners and, and even with CEOs or management in smaller businesses, which are just on payroll, for example, yeah. you will see that when that person wants something new to happen, they have this huge network where they can just knock on the door and everybody is coming with new ideas. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, a friend of mine, he's a business owner and he lost his business. He, he is very well known. So what happened is he just, he, he sold his business off. He said, it's time for something else. He just put one social media post live telling like, this is the step I've taken. I'm looking for something new in that direction. He got over 150 requests within the day of other business owners yeah. like, please come work with me on my business. Yeah. yeah. Like th yeah. that's that's yeah. that's the biggest value that you yeah. can get. But the, the fear of a lot of uh, CEOs and founders and owners of companies is that when when we mention personal branding, they immediately think of becoming kind of a celebrity CEO, um, a personal brand, famous, um, press is on the lookout, paparazzi all over the place. Uh, so they are afraid and they don't realize there is a difference between being a visible CEO who's there, who is building a community, yeah. who has an audience, who has a voice, but is not necessarily the celebrity CEO like Walter Torfs is or the, or the personal brand uh, no. um, or, or the thought leader. There are differences. There are levels in, in becoming visible, but you should be visible as Absolutely. a CEO just to build your legacy think... and represent the company. I think yeah, go a good ahead. topic to, to lean into to that is to, and that's something that I would suggest for everybody who is thinking about, about going out there, is 
take a, a blank piece of paper and start just writing in, in short bullet points what makes you you. Mm -hmm. And then start selecting from that what do you want people to see. Like, also for me, I'm very open about these things. I'm, I don't have the best relation uh, with a lot of the business guru stuff that's going on. Like, it's become so... Ooh, no, Marketing. I'm fed up with that. It's, it's oh my god! But it's so, it's so materialized. Mm -hmm. It's like you have the the 25 year old life coach, business coach who is showing that he's driving a Porsche or or a Ferrari or something like that, mm -hmm. and it also maybe even just rented it for a day. Mm -hmm. But like, it's 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 something that that kind of sickens me because. But that's something that, that needs to resonate with you. Like yeah. maybe that's you showing that beautiful car yes. and, and going yeah. out there and showing that success. And there'll be an audience for that. Um, I'm not here to judge. But for me, for example, one of the things that I've decided is I, I love nature. Like one of the things that pleases me the most is I had the chance of buying a large um, nature reserve. Um, which I started maintaining. It's a forest, it's, it's grasslands. It has these uh, Scottish Highland cows running around on that. And, and for me, that's something like, I love nature. Every trip mm -hmm. that I do involves nature. If mm -hmm. I f want to have peace and quiet in my mind, I, I turn to nature. So that's something that I very consciously decided to show to the world. Like, mm -hmm. I want that to be out there as a part of me. On mm -hmm. the other side, I drive a very beautiful car, but nobody will ever find a Facebook post or whatever showing that car. Mm -hmm. Because to me, that doesn't matter. And I don't want people to Judge not, even, not even put a value on me because of whatever I can show in terms of how wealthy I might or might not be. Mm -hmm. nice. Because then the discussion is not going in the right direction for me yeah. anymore. Yeah. Um, so, but that's some, that, those are things that you need to be very conscious about. Um, and I think if somebody would just sit for one hour and just write down what makes you you, what are the traits, what are your interests, what are things that move you, and then just circle a few and think, well, how can I this is what I want to show the world and how can I implement that in my story? You end up having a personal brand, which is very true to yourself, which you don't need to invent a lot of things that weren't existing, but you know, like I need to drive a beautiful car because then a lot of people are going to be interested in me. Like that's moving completely wrong. And mm -hmm. I think if somebody would just start out with that simple exercise they are going to end yeah. up with something that they are proud of sharing with the world. Yeah. So uh, last question. Mm -hmm. You teach your students and clients uh, to work towards an exit of their business. So, of course, my last question is, do you already have an exit strategy for Blackbird business? Yeah. We, really? we, we founded the company. It's, it's like the one thing that I want to change is essentially the way you asked the question. And I'm glad you asked the question that way. But a lot of people think uh, when I start thinking about my exit, it means that I'm willing to sell my business. Whereas that's something that I want to say to everybody, stop thinking like that. Um, Use that exit strategy, which is just one part of thinking like an investor and looking towards your business. But use all of that to shape the way you want to build that company rather than to only start thinking about it when you want to let go of that business. Mm -hmm. Like, because you instantly start asking the right type of questions. If I was um, not starting Blackbird with um, my exit strategy in mind, the company would probably be named Andy Coleman's training company or something like that. 
I didn't do it because of the fact that I don't want this business to be the Andy show. So even if I still play a crucial part in, in being on that stage today, even if I want to continue doing so for a lot of years, mm -hmm. I don't want that company to be reliant on me 100% because of that. So it's the fact that we started this business and all, and, and to be open with you about it, I'm currently participating in seven different businesses in different industries. All of those companies that were founded when we stepped in as an investor, me and my wife, we always do everything 50, 50. Mm -hmm. Every time the first question was, what is the exit strategy? How are we going to let go of this company? And when are we going to let go of this company? And it means that you open yourself up to not only ans asking the questions which are very visibly in front of you. It allows you to start asking the questions which you might not have thought of before. Yeah. Yeah. Because then you start thinking about ownership. Are we going to build a company which is this big, doing 10 million, or is 1 million enough? And how are we going to get to that 10 million? Is it going to be a business where we, at a certain point, are open to allow an investor or a private equity fund to step into this business? Mm -hmm. And are we, are, we, are we able to work with a company like that? Or do we still want to decide everything 100% ourselves? Because then we might not build that 10 million euro business so you instantly start thinking in a different direction for us um, one of the things and i'm very open about that it means that starting this company from that perspective um, meant that we started the business with a very participative model where we now have four shareholders in the business who are operating the business and the fifth one is is on its way um, we are talking, um, everybody working with this company knows that at a certain point when they've proven themselves, when they fit the culture, when they work with us, at a certain point, everybody who's a key player will have a chance to be a part of this, what we're building. Mm -hmm. um, and on the, the, on the aspect of the courses that we give, from day one, we've been building a team of, of um not only me as a, as a main host for our events, but also using other teachers who bring content from certain niches. Um, we're looking into a buy and build strategy because my voice is become that entrepreneur investor. I don't want to be doing things like um, lifestyle coaching or real estate or uh, become a better leader or something because that's not what I want to talk about. And it's not what Blackbird should be about either. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that we can't think outside of the box that we have created for ourselves today. Yeah. So my answer is, when do you need to start thinking about an exit strategy? Well, the moment you think of yeah. putting that business to life. When you start your business. Because it will decide everything. Yeah. yeah. It will decide everything, every major decision that you're going to make moving forward. Wow, beautiful. I'm really loving this conversation. And, and if I can add something else extra Is to that, something? one yes. thing, yes, one thing, well, a lot of business owners, if they would look at what they've created in their life as value, yeah. um, most of them, they don't know what the value of their business is. Let me tell you, with everybody running a a decent sized company. I'm not talking about 100 employees. I'm talking about 10 employees, 20 employees. A lot of the company owners, they've taken little to no money home because the money was needed to scale up that business when they were building it. They don't know how much their business is worth. Uh, so uh, an advice, uh, have a valuation made of your business every year. So you know what the worth of that business is and how it corresponds with everything else that you've created in value. Because for most company owners, 80 to 90% of their entire net worth is shares of one business that they've created. And once you start looking at it like that, 
it becomes an unbearable risk to keep it like that until the end of your career. It, it's just plain stupid because the average lifespan of a business is 15 years. So why would you keep all of that value in there for yes. 35 years, maybe? And then on the other side, it also means that you 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 don't well you you just you just start creating other decisions around the entire process of putting that value to work. Most of the company owners, they take a little bit of money home by getting paid every month and getting dividends once a year, which is like crumbs falling from the table, mm -hmm. where they, on the other hand, have a business which is worth like 5 million euros, perhaps. And that 5 million is just standing there until the end of their career, Whereas they, if they would allow other companies to take part in that business, uh, other people to take part in that business, if they would think about it like an investor, they would leverage those five millions yeah. every five to seven or eight years. And that is what you're teaching them in your classes and courses. Yes. Of course. Well, I can only I recommend you have... Sorry? To... <laughs> sorry? I, I think can... it's just something a question that everybody needs to ask themselves. Yeah, yeah. I can Indeed. certainly only recommend you after hearing you talk over the last uh, 40, 50 <laughs> minutes. So I'm really flabbergasted of, uh, of uh, your insights. But we have come to an end of our conversation. So uh, I've... Um, um... I want to thank you, uh, Ianka, for, for inviting me here and for uh, having this discussion with me. Um, I hope a lot of listeners and viewers of this, pod of this podcast are going to think about leveraging their personal brand a lot more. Oh, and I'm sure you. you're going to help a lot of them do that. <laughs>